The M16, America's answer to the dreaded AK-47. For half a century, American servicemen have carried the M16 into combat on battlefields around the world. So, why does the M16 suck? First, we have to acknowledge its history. The M16 was introduced shortly after America's entry to Vietnam. Prior to this, the US Army had been busy at work contemplating the future of the infantryman's battle rifle. Data showed that the average infantry engagement in both World War II and Korea had taken place at approximately 300 yards or less, and that past 100 yards, the accuracy of the American soldiers declined drastically. This put into serious question the need for a traditional heavy rifle round such as the 30-06, which was great for long-range engagements but seriously weighed soldiers down and was difficult to build a one-man rapid-firing weapon system around. The future called for lighter rounds and faster-firing weapons. If the weight of an infantryman's ammunition could be reduced, it would allow them to carry more of it, which would extend their combat effectiveness on a battlefield where resupply could be difficult if not impossible. One other advantage, however, was that a lighter round was with a lighter recoil would encourage a soldier to shoot more, dramatically increasing the individual killing potential. For a few years, the Army even considered adopting a multi-barrel weapon or a flechette-type round. Combat data combined with data collected on firing ranges showed that near misses were frequent, and if a weapon could fire more than one projectile or fire a group of them at rapid speed, near misses could still turn into hits. One product of this research was the SPIW, or Special Purpose Individual Weapon, which would be prototyped in the early 1960s. It featured 60 rounds which could be fired in single or burst fire modes, with each round containing tiny steel flechettes. It was accompanied by a grenade launcher featuring three 40mm grenades. The weapon, however, was ultimately a flop, as it proved to be entirely too mechanically difficult to maintain in the field, and the ammunition that promised to turn near misses into lethal hits unreliable. Eventually, a more traditional approach to combat rifles was taken, resulting in the M14 rifle. With heavy influence from the M1 Grand, this was a tried-and-true weapon system, and completely obsolete by the time the US hit the jungles of Vietnam. While the United States was experimenting with flechettes and eventually fell back on World War II technology, the Soviet Union had been creating the future. Their own experiences in World War II proved that the infantrymen of tomorrow needed a rapid-firing weapon with moderate range which could be used to suppress an enemy. Traditional semi-automatic big battle rifles such as the US's M1 or the future M14 could not accomplish this. So the Soviets turned to inspiration from the German Sturmgreher 44, the world's first battle-ready assault rifle. The STG-44 featured rapid rapid fire and a larger magazine with an effective range of 300 meters in automatic mode and 600 meters in semi-automatic mode. The result was the AK-47, a weapon that took everything that was great about the STG-44 and made it even better. And as American forces made their first patrols into the thick jungles of Vietnam, tens of thousands of AK-47s were waiting for them. The result was an immediate disaster for American infantrymen. The AK-47 completely outgunned the M14 in everything but accuracy. US infantrymen found themselves overwhelmed by enemy fire and unable to return even a fraction of the incoming fire. It was only superior training and fire support that averted the all-out defeat. The US had a serious problem, and it needed to rectify it fast. Colt's AR-15 was rapidly put into production. The initial response was extremely favorable by America's Asian allies, however, the M14 remained the official US battle rifle, and there was significant pushback against adopting a new rifle by senior military leadership, so the AR-15 remained largely the tool of US allies and American special forces. As US special forces began to report favorable engagements with the enemy armed with AK-47s, however, it started to become clear the M14 needed to go. American troops met the new weapon with initial skepticism. They were used to the solid wood and steel construction of the M14, and despite warping in the humid jungles of Vietnam causing serious accuracy issues with the M14, the solid feel of the heavy weapon in its wood stock still offered a level of comfort to an infantryman. By comparison, the AR-15, now renamed the M16, was nearly half the weight of an M14 and largely made out of plastic. To American troops, it seemed more toy than serious rifle. However, the ability to carry a greater load of lighter ammunition and the selective fire features of the rifle soon won over American GIs sick of going up against walls of lead put out by the AK. Within months of being issued in large numbers to US troops, it would pass its own trial by fire. The Battle of La Drang was the first engagement between regular US forces and North Vietnamese forces. Soon after, US troops from the 7th Cavalry Regiment were inserted via helicopter and two previously scouted LZs that came under fire from NVA forces. The three-day battle saw vastly outnumbered US forces fighting a desperate battle of survival against an enemy determined to overwhelm and defeat them. With no land route in, the only reinforcements possible were via helicopter, and if the LZs were lost, the men were doomed. Armed with the M16 rifle, US forces achieved a tactical victory with a kill ratio of 10 to 1. The M16 is directly credited by many troops and officers as being the key to the victory, but things were soon to go dramatically wrong. As is expected of a new weapon, there were serious parts problems 
problems that would have to be identified and fixed in future manufacturing runs. These problems, however, could be fatal for a grunt on the ground. Under the stress of full auto fire, the early M16's bolt would have a tendency to crack, rendering the weapon little more than a moderately expensive club. Similarly, the stress of firing thousands of rounds across multiple engagements would lead to the disconnector or hammer spring snapping off, and the constant firing would corrode the chamber and bore both. The plastic stocks and grips were also notorious for cracking or breaking, which would either make the weapon useless or seriously degrade accuracy. A big source of problems for the M16 wasn't even the rifle itself, but rather the powder that went into the weapons it fired. Armalite had originally used IMR4475 powder in their development of the weapon, but the US military had an exclusive contract with Olin Matheson, who used ball-shaped WC846 powder. The entire rifle had been in essence built around using the stick powder used in IMR4475 gunpowder. But the ball powder of WC846 didn't just have different geometry, but completely different performance. Initial batches of M16s to Vietnam had been equipped with the original 846 gunpowder ammunition, hence the very favorable performance of the weapon early in the war. As the rifle was formally adopted by the US military though, its ammunition supplier changed and the problems immediately began. The new ammunition burned differently, which led to greater pressure. The greater pressure increased both muzzle velocity and firing rate, which sounds like a good thing, but not when your weapon isn't designed to handle such big changes in pressure. The higher pressures put undue stress on the gas port and the bolt carrier group as the entire assembly was forced to operate more violently and faster than it had been designed to do. Among many issues such as cracked bolts and a thoroughly fouled weapon, the high-speed movement of the bolt carrier group and the free-floating nature of the firing pin directly led to a dramatic increase in misfires. While these misfires were easy to fix most of the time by simply cycling the weapon, they required precious seconds and could mean the difference between life and death. The greater muzzle velocity, however, also shortened the amount of time between the cartridge burning and the rifle beginning to cycle. This meant that as the rifle attempted to extract a round, often the round itself was still under immense gas pressure, making it difficult or impossible to extract, leading once more to a misfire. How was the rifle being issued with the wrong ammunition? The answer to that question is tricky, but there's strong evidence that the AR-15 was being purposely sabotaged from within the US Army itself. The old dogs at the US Army Ordnance Corps were clearly not fans of the AR-15 and believe that traditional rifles such as the M1 Grand with its heavy proven round and long-range accuracy should remain the future. Not only was the AR-15 being unfairly judged, but when it came time to test Colt and Armalite stick powder, the Ordnance Corps ruled that it was not a viable propellant. Why? Because the Corps decided that the M16 needed a higher muzzle velocity, which the ball powder ammunition the US had been using for half a century provided. Never mind that this was outside of the weapon's specs, or that the fact that the US military having a single source contract for all of its ammunition made it extremely lucrative for Olin Matheson to continue supplying all ammunition needs for the US. Was there internal corruption at work in the US Army Ordnance Corps to ensure the US didn't switch its ammunition supplier? The question begs asking. Incredibly, despite American experiences in the Pacific during World War II and the extremely human nature of Vietnam, a basic engineering mistake would be one of the rifle's biggest downfalls. When the M16 hit the jungles of Vietnam, the rifle was not chrome-plated. This directly led to corrosion inside of the barrel itself and the formation of tiny pits inside the barrel. Normally, when the round is fired, the brass cartridge momentarily expands, creating a gas seal inside the chamber. As the pressure drops, the brass contracts again, allowing it to be extracted, ejected, and a new round fed in. With a heavily corroded barrel, however, the brass cartridge could actually get stuck after expanding, leading to a failure to extract. This was no easy simply cycle your weapon fix. This was often a serious issue that required inserting a cleaning rod into the barrel in order to dislodge the stuck cartridge. Experience a misfire like this in the brutal close quarters combat of Vietnam, and it was over for you. So, why weren't M16 barrels chrome-coated? Don't blame Colt or Armalite, the developer of the rifle. Both informed the US military that they needed to invest in chrome plating, but the US Army refused, stating that there was no need and it was too costly. The M16 was nothing if not a comedy of errors, and the next biggest mistake would come from the way the rifle was issued to troops. Some way or another, the rifle had gotten the reputation of self-cleaning, a frankly ludicrous proposition for any weapon. But given its space-age design, the reputation stuck. When Colt sent officials to Vietnam to understand the problems with the weapon, they were shocked to discover that soldiers simply weren't cleaning their weapons, and few if any had actually had cleaning kits issued with them. The gunpowder, dirt, dust, and everything in between fouling up the weapons, at least it was a quick fix that required nothing more than the issuing of cleaning kits. But it was probably the dumbest mistake the United States military ever made, and one that should never have happened. Incredibly, during the early years of the war, American soldiers were having to write letters home begging their families to send them cleaning kits and lubricant for their weapons. Absolutely unacceptable. Despite these issues, the M16 would eventually redeem itself and become a weapon 
been more than capable of tackling the Soviet AK-47, yet even today the weapon and its direct descent of the M4 still receives plenty of criticism. Does the weapon suck today? One of the biggest modern problems with the weapon is that as the US entered wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, it brought with it an ammunition supply that had been originally developed to take on the Soviet Union. American 5.56 ammunition with steel penetrators were great at punching through body armor, but not so great on taking on insurgents and military wearing no body armor. The steel penetrator rounds would zip right through an enemy combatant, often causing little damage and requiring multiple hits to ensure a kill. The issue was eventually resolved, and the lethality of the M4s and M16s in use during the war immediately increased. However, for the last two decades there's been an increasing call for a switch to a heavier round and necessarily a brand new weapon system. The M4 of today boasts exceptional range, accuracy, and very acceptable lethality, but a growing number of voices within the US military and political establishment feel that to compete in the future, American soldiers need a firepower upgrade. Whether this is true or not remains to be seen, but with half a century of service around the world, the M16 and M4 have truly proven their worth. We can only hope that if a new battle rifle is adopted by the US, it's done a lot better than last time.